um, what's new in offsite? That's the subject. And and what um, prompted that subject was that, um, well, let, let's cast our mind back to 2016 with Hertfordshire Building Control being set up. And I was telling our um, MD at the time, Simon Hayward, that uh, we needed to prepare for an evolution in the construction industry. Uh, we had a housing crisis. We had a need for a huge number of new homes in coming years. And coupled with that, we had reports like the Farmer Report warning the industry to modernise or die. So we thought, right, the offsite and an, an MMC sector seems to be uh, a large wave building on the horizon. And we need to prepare for that. And we need to be able to meet it when it comes with a tailored service um, to harmonise with it and, and harmonise with the streamlined construction process that it it had promised to to, to bring with it. Um, things like when I say tailored service, modify our inspection processes to suit an, uh, an on-site assembly process rather than a construction process. Uh, we foresaw much more importance being given on third-party accreditation uh, of the manufacturing process rather than checking the work on site. We didn't want to be building control to hold up and, and stifle the, um, the construction process when it took place. So as a result of that, um, we talked to a lot of people. We, we joined off-site, um, the, the national organisation um, representing that sector in the industry. We engaged with uh, and set up partnerships with a lot of companies in the sector. And we basically you know, waited for the wave to come to shore. Well, seven years on, uh, I have to say it's possibly been more of a ripple than a tsunami. Um, and consequently, I thought, well, why not a, a, a topic for a, a Hertfordshire Building Control webinar? Um, it, it, it lends itself and, and it might be interesting to you, our audience, uh, and an opportunity to find out the latest developments and maybe why uptake has been so much slower than we uh, anticipated. So very grateful to Build Offsite for um, arranging for our three, three very experienced and knowledgeable speakers from the sector to talk to us this afternoon. Um, and as I said, the, we'll post up the bios in the um, chat section if you're interested. So first to go, without further ado, uh, we've got Ken Davey. Now, Ken is a, an architect, but he's uh, also an industry advisor in the offsite on the offsite um, sector, and he is representing Build Offsite. So, Ken, take take it away. Thanks, Trevor. Do I have control? Yeah, I've passed over control to you, Ken. There you go. Okay, there we go. Afternoon, everyone. It's interesting. Uh, the, some of these comments Trevor has, has been making. If you if you look at the way that other products develop over the years, it's quite fascinating. Um, quite often in, in development, you'll see a bell curve, which obviously starts with the uh, um, the innovators and then works its way through to the through early adopters and to the sort of general general approach. And I think from a, an offsite perspective, we you know some some parts of the industry probably are into the adopters, uh, the early, certainly beyond the early adopters, but I think other, in other areas we haven't actually reached that point yet. What I'm going to do this afternoon very briefly is just uh, give you an overview of um, build off site itself. If we can get the slides to, to move. It doesn't want to see, doesn't seem to be want to be shifting, Rachel. No, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, there must be a slight delay here. Well, as you can see, build off site was, was set up uh, quite some time ago. Um, we It's a membership organisation and, and we, we work in collaboration with members and, and industry stakeholders as, as much as we can. Uh, one of the key aspects of what we do is to organise webinars um, with interested parties covering a number of topics. This is this is one example. We also do webinars on, on uh, net zero through Syria, um, low carbon solutions. Uh, but as you can see, um, the aim of, of the organization is, is outlined at the bottom. So that's a, a brief overview in, in terms of, of a build off site. Um, we, yeah, there we go. Um, 
Trevor, Trevor explained I'm an industry advisor. My, my remit within Build Off Site is the Built Environment Working Group. Um, this is actually a list of, of, of events, visits and webinars, part, some of which are actually um, already organised. So this is, this is actually what we're, we're looking at um, to encourage more use of offsite um, as, as the industry picks up again, um, seven long years after the, after the, the farmer report. One of the objectives of these um, events is actually networking. Um, it's nice to, to be on the screen and, and, and speak in a webinar, but there, there isn't, there, it takes a lot to actually meet face-to-face -face networking. We're obviously seriously compromised as an organisation for a couple of years because of um, the pandemic, um, and we are beginning to pick up and, and move things on again. So um, if you are a member of, of, of Build Off Site, you look out for these events coming up <clears throat> in the next four or five months. If you're not a member of, of Build Off Site, you, you will find the details on the website and you can still um, uh, register to attend, although there may well be a small charge um, for non-members attending. Some interesting stuff coming up. Um, what's new, again, was the topic. This is a little bit of product development. Um, we haven't done much by way of innovation. Um, this is uh, prefabricated uh, pipework. It's a product developed by a company called Ali Access. The uh, uh, a few a few um, of members of, from uh, Build Off Site were at the factory last uh, Tuesday morning to have a look at these components. The it starts off with a simple vertical stack with a, a pre-jointed, and I can imagine, as, as uh, Trevor said, you're you're potentially looking to check these products in the factory before they actually go on site. So starting from a simple stack, all the working all the way through to um, what is a more complicated service riser, um, and that that particular unit is designed with self-locating vertical um, features, um, and that was demonstrated in the factory last week um, in a small scale. And again, it's nice to actually see things like that in the flesh. So you'll see them on a screen, you'll see them in a um, in a presentation, but to actually physically be able to walk around and have a close look and see see the actual unit stacking, it, it, it makes a nice difference. This is something else which is new and off-site. Um, not only do I work with uh, Build Off-Site, I actually uh, work with the Supply Chain Sustainability School. The school's actually uh, free of charge. Anybody can join the school by registering, and that gives you access to all of the training material um, in the offsite area, and there's a major uh, section on sustainability itself. This report um, or the, uh, guidance was published in April of this year, and one of the things it addresses is where is the carbon. It's looking to uh, to actually establish where the carbon is being produced in the the uh, construction and operational use of a of a development, such that um, prefabricated components. Can under, uh, companies producing pre-fabricated components can understand where where they should target to try and reduce their carbon footprint. As you can see, uh, the vast majority of that operational carbon is actually, in, uh, sorry, the, the, the vast majority of the carbon is, is the operational energy use. And as we move to renewables, that will diminish quite significantly. Therefore, the other percentages in that graph will actually increase. You can get a copy of that by logging on to the supply, registering with the school and actually downloading it for anybody who's interested. What's new in, in, in the research and, 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 and sort of standards field, uh, I think it was, uh, it was published very, very recently that uh, British Standards Institute are actually developing PAS 8700 uh, to develop a document to define uh, as you can see, consistency and quality for MMC in the residential sector. Initial consultation in January. Um, the draft scope has been published for comment, um, and the intention is to publish uh, in the autumn. Along alongside PAS eight seven hundred, the Homes England has been. 
sponsoring and fund sorry funding some um research and uh into into mmc i seem to be stuck again rachel i don't know what's we seem to have a, a time lag here yeah <clears throat> homes england <clears throat> and obviously had has a company called Ackerloff working on a project to develop a digital kit of parts for mmc categories two and five for those who who don't know the MMC categories. Uh, category two is flat back panel systems, um, flat back structural panel systems. And category five, well, my my interpret or uh, my view on that tends to be everything that's not in categories one, two, three, and four. Um, there are seven categories altogether, but six and seven are not about pre-manufacturing. So we've got um, the digital kit of kit of parks as as a new project ongoing for Homes England, and at the same time. Uh, the University University College of London is running another research project, uh, again for Homes England, looking at the forces for and against. So, as as Trevor said, there's there seems to be a lot of resistance and not much has happened in the last seven years. However, UCL, on behalf of Homes England, is trying to understand exactly where that resistance and what should needs to change. And what could be a, what what could be done to improve the uptake? I th I think that's my last slide, Trevor. There we are. Um, the two things that came out of that UCL survey, interestingly, were assurance, i.e., some form of guarantee, effectively, and insurance for modern methods of construction. There is a nervousness in the industry, and obviously, changing uh, approach, changing behaviours. And as I say, Trevor, I think that's that's it for me. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, thank, thanks for that, Ken. Nice, nice to see there's still a little bit of impetus behind it, even if we, we, we're yet to see the fruits of that. But uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So, yeah, moving on swiftly then. Ne next up, we've got um, an environmental consultant, a chartered builder and a chartered environmentalist um, called John O'Brien. And John is with Tempo Housing. Uh, John, what? What's your thoughts on on where we are with the uh, offsite sector at the moment? Thank you, Trevor. Um, just want to tell you a bit about what we've been up to and um, our approach, and uh, how we are hoping that more people will join us. You know, and sort of see um, what how we've approached it, and there's more opportunities for SMEs to uh, expand into the market, engage with SMEs as well, builders and the like. I think everyone wants to build if every builder wants to build more houses, but how are they going to build them with the resources that are currently available? So um, I'll, I will go on to sort of mention how maybe we can engage more people into this process. So a little bit, a little bit of background on, we'll start with the challenge. I suppose to say that uh, Timber Housing, we are based in um, UK and Ireland. Um, we're part of a sort of bigger group uh, based in Europe, but this is our venture. The, the, the first ventures into UK and, and Ireland. Um, Deborah Smith is a managing director and she's been campaigning and sort of championing the, the whole um, modular construction for quite a while. So I'll come on to some of the things that we've been covering over the last five years, I suppose. I've been involved for about three years on this project. So what's the challenge? Two million homes. Um, there's a lot of people who will out, go out there and say, They'll come up with a report to say we don't need two million homes. That's uh, uh, alarmist or whatever. But I worked in social housing and I could see how many for many years, and I could see how the demand for homes was there, and the right kind of homes and the right size of homes as well. You know, three bedroom ho homes are like gold dust in um, in social housing. I think we had a thirty seven year waiting list alone just for that. So, so how, how did your children sort of? Uh, left home long before you'll ever get enough rooms to to sort of accommodate them. And we also mm -hmm. want to raise the quality of housing. We see a lot of stuff on the TV about uh, defect, defects in homes and uh, people moving in. One of my colleagues, she spent the first year um, using the opportunity to work from home as as the repairs were made on her house, on her flat, uh, her first home as she was uh, spending that first year uh, of tidying things up and keeping things uh you know what it should have been handed over as a finished package fuel poverty that you know 
we I used to talk about fuel poverty a lot and people didn't really get it. But in the last year, we've all got it. We know it. We're all cutting down. We're all wearing extra jumpers. This is just what fuel poor people have been doing, having to choose between heating and eating for a long time. Rising energy costs. Again, it's um, it's been creeping up slowly for a long time, but we've had very cheap energy for a long time. And now we're actually paying a more realistic price and realizing um, what the costs are. And material costs, you know, again, we, we didn't need a world crisis to tell us this. We didn't need a war in Europe. Um, things were sort of heading that way. So again, how do we become more resource efficient? How do we use the products we've got better? And how do we move away from fossil fuels? You know, that's our dependence. You know, we had cheap coal and then cheap oil and cheap gas. And now um, there's not a lot cheap out there. And of course, there's that enduring problem that so we're all trying to address. How do we, how do we get more people to build these homes? So uh, I'll let, that is, that's always been a struggle and um, I don't think it's going to go away in a hurry. So sustainability, it's, we got to do it. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's think of the planet. Let's do the right, the right approaches. And um, our approach is to sort of say, how much can we put in uh, into a volumetric unit so that uh, people can move in um, as soon as possible, the landlord can get returns, rental returns on it quicker. And, um, obviously what we're offering is warmth and comfort. And if you can't afford the fuel, then why not minimize the amount of fuel that you need to, we, uh, we've got the intelligence and the, we've got the data on what, what is required to create minimal heat, uh, to keep people in a level of comfort, but comfort also covers overheating as well. So as we get more of these, you know, Europe is unbearable at the moment. Um, how do we address the overheating issues and what happens to vulnerable people? 20 odd thousand people died of overheating issues in Europe last year. We're going to have probably worse issues and we don't want to become part of that story as well. Um, we go down the fabric first approach. Let's build them as best we can. Um, how do we get the right levels of insulation or the right types of insulation for those, um, uh, for those, um, locations are you by a busy road do you have an acoustics issue that kind of thing um standardization of products is key now uh we want to develop a number of options that architects can sort of pick our bim object uh, item and just say right that we can drop that into our scheme we want to be involved earlier in the process we don't want to come in at stage four and five we want to get in there at stage one as part of the feasibility study we don't want to be coming along trying to squeeze our standardized units into a triangular shaped and curved um, building and the like, um, we'll lose a lot of the advantages there. We can't be adapting standardized projects. And at the moment we are focusing on affordable housing, but as often mixed out, most estates the these days, uh, developments are sort of mixed tenures. So we, we're providing a product that's good enough for use across tenures and, um, Ultimately, how can we then get it to zero carbon? How do we hit our 2025 targets? You know, we're not just hanging on the current building regulations. We're, we're looking ahead. So what is the next generation of products out there? BIM mentioned that briefly. It's a language. We've got to talk to each other in a, in a common language across the industry. Um, we want accurate data. We want accurate flow of that data as well and managed as well. So, um, it's amazing that I've. Dealing with landlords where they, they don't actually know what they've got, what their stock is. About 5% of landlords aren't really understood and understand what they, they own and how they maintain it and how they optimize the life of that building. So if you, if you're starting off from a good point of BIM, you're able to say, this is your building. This is how you manage it. And this is when you replace components, um, to keep it up to its maximum life. The DFMA ready, we're talking about sort of platforms and making sure it's manufacturing ready. And, um, yeah, if we can, if we can create BIM objects that we can hand to architects at that stage one, even better. So what we've done, we've developed a concept called Modular Express. Um, it can, by using these standardized platforms, we can create single studios right up to sort of multiple family spaces. Um, we want to use the best insulations property and team up with, uh, suppliers that will help us along in the process as well. Um. We want to make sure our, whatever we're cladding it in isn't going to cause a problem later on. We're trying to make sure we're going for sort of class A, um, 
products wherever possible, um, or certainly nothing that's going to be causing a risk of um, spread of flame. Uh, we, we've we got Mitsubishi as a partner as well for our heat pumps. We There's no reason why we would be putting fossil fuels into our homes. Um, the load is so small, you know, we're talking a couple of kilowatts um, sort of energy use, two, three, four. So go for a small heat pump, go, you know, manage that. Heating, from heating and hot water, hot water becomes the biggest energy load in the house because they'll be well, so well insulated. Um, we also are saying, well, let's build our units part M ready. We're an aging population, um, extraordinary. So why, why build buildings that then will have to be adapted later? Let's give them the space for people to move around. They're easily adaptable, whether it's wheelchair or um, hoist ready, whatever. So don't let's not sort of, I don't want people going in and adapting our units in the future. It should be simple and uh, ready and fit for purpose. So how do we achieve net zero? Well, fabric first, that's key. Um, We've worked very hard on eliminating any cold bridging. Um, that could cause all sorts of issues. Obviously, we don't want damp and mold and everything else sort of tainting the products. So let's get the cold bridging right. And we're ready for the improved building regulations when the new SAP kicks in 25 and our, low, our zero carbon targets, really. So whatever we're building now, you know, going through any anything going through um, planning now should be ready for um, those improved targets. Uh, obviously, key areas around air tightness, um, optimizing your values. Um, one of the other things we want to make sure is, is the accuracy of the construction and the assembly as well. So that's how we know that any, if we haven't got accurate data, accurate construction, really fine tolerances um, made in the factory, then uh, we're not going to be able to achieve the product, the desired performance on site. And we will measure, we'll do post occupancy in all the units as well, because we want to get that feedback, really understand uh, the benefits of going down the volumetric route. Um, and then once you've achieved that, then you think about putting renewables on. So they're then tailored to the uh, demands of those um, sort of occupants. So it's a lot, a lot of people sort of are sort of renewables driven and that thinks that will achieve it. No, you, you've got to get the fabric right and then go from there. And then ultimately any, any construction in CO2, uh, the emissions is, is offset. So we, we are achieving it. So our homes were looking to probably about 1400 kilowatts a year. That, that used to translate about 250 pounds a year in sort of heating and hot water and sort of general regulated use. Uh, that'll, that might go up, but actually if you can cover the regulated emissions through renewables, then you're insulating people from future energy price rises as well. So we've got PV panels, we've got an option of a battery if the scheme allows. Um, if we can get five kilowatts per apartment, then we're, we're in a good area and um, cover it. We, we just want to achieve whatever we can to clear, clear down the uh, regulated and then maybe potentially sort of give people a bit of extra to um, cover their unregulated use of appliances as well. So we all need to keep our fridge on and similar. So this is our project. One of our first projects is in Dublin. So it's a handy little sort of brownfield site up down the back street. Um, but we, we're going to be able to just use 12 modules, create six one bedroom flats, um, 48 square meters each. And uh, it gives us the um, potential to give a, 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 a good example of what the, it, it can achieve. And without having to sort of stress the whole volumetric we're, we're just trying to produce homes that are, are fit for purpose and uh, meet the meet the zero carbon targets so they'll be if, if people walk past and don't notice and unless they were there on the day then they were when they were being craned in then there shouldn't be an issue so this is another scheme we developed for bristol um one one shape one module able to create um a number of different layouts in this case 37 square meter studio homes but with, with their own separate bedroom i think if you're going to go down the studio route let's uh, at least make sure we've got the, the opportunity for private bedrooms and, and have got separate bedrooms this gives a better quality of life they've got their own front door um quickly assembled probably not as quick as a presentation there but you know i think we could assemble those 12 these are 12 flats 
um, over over two floors a couple of days. So we're looking at the savings on the uh, site, uh, the preliminaries, the construction costs, it's other time frames. There's lots we can do in these areas. And these are some of the pictures of the interior. Um, that's just on a studio flat, it, um, 37 square meters. I think we can uh, do well. Uh, bedroom again, big enough for a, a double bed, tidily. Um, hat is optional, and the um, you've got a, a good size bathroom, um, shower room. Again, part M ready, so it's not a case of um, having to adapt it later. It's just ready, ready to go. And these are some of the interiors of our modules for our island project. We don't have to. Um, Go for the basic we don't have to sort of really uh, go for cheap uh, as possible it doesn't take a great deal to make something a home that people will look after and really sort of value and um, cherish so with a, with a little bit of imagination a bit of wallpaper and a bit of textures and stuff like that we want we do want people to be able to uh, really be proud of their homes and this is what we, our schemes will look like so our modular systems can either create one two story houses we can go up to five stories it's bypass certified um uh, we've had a great association with build off site to um get our message out there and talk to people and thank you for the opportunity today with uh with uh, Arthur as well to sort of say what we're up to and uh bringing people up to speed so again if just using a fairly simple platform of modules we can create a number of different schemes it's not, it's certainly not, a, it doesn't lack texture. And if you can team it up with some really good regeneration projects, then, which is what our, our aim, then uh, we can add to add value to that. So that was a quick sort of summary of where we're at um, and some contact details there, if anyone's interested in some more details. And uh, I'll, we'll take questions later once they've been assembled. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. Some really good, um, some really great company aspirations there, and interesting to see how how um, how you're going. And wish you the very best of luck with those projects. Um, and uh, perfectly on time. So Rachel's definitely happy with that and smiling. So um, all good so far. So good. Um, on now to our next speaker, our final speaker, who is David Johnson. David is pre-construction director of Volumetric Building Companies. Thank you, Trevor. Um, I'm going to adopt a slightly different approach for my presentation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about products. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit more philosophical about the market and where we are and where I think and, and where my business thinks we need to be. But just to give you a bit of perspective, I think I've got quite an interesting perspective. Um, I worked for a top five tier one contractor for 13 years, then a UK volumetric modular manufacturer for seven years and now for a US-based global manufacturer. Um, so I'm responsible for pipeline development, not just in the UK, but for all territories outside the US. So I'm currently looking at projects in Europe uh, and emerging territories, um, Saudi Arabia and the Ukraine. So I think I've got quite a good perspective about, um, about the state of the UK MMC business, because the man modular manufacturer I work for, unfortunately, was one of the ones that um, that doesn't exist in its in its previous format. So let me start by just giving you a little bit of background as to VBC, and, and in case you don't know who VBC are, because we're not particularly active in the UK. So we're a technology-led manufacturing business headquartered in Philadelphia, and uh, the business was born out of the need for affordable housing. Uh, VBC began life as a general contractor. Um, and a general contracting business about 10 years ago. And it's expand, expanded incredibly rapidly. We've now got facilities on the East Coast of America, West Coast of America, and as I said, in Europe and emerging markets. Um, one of the benefits, certainly from a personal perspective, is we're incredibly financially stable. Um, and I know that is a real big question mark. Uh, at this point in time, we're backed by PIMCO. And we're a $1.7 trillion investment management company so we have no lack of investment support and we're certainly looking at the UK hence the reason I work for the business as, as a key 
area for investment, but that's there are a number of caveats, and that's what I want to come on to later. So in 2021, we merged with Polcom. Uh, so that gave us our Polish manufacturing facility, brought hospitality into the portfolio, uh, and gave us a steel technology to add to the wood technology that we already use across the US. Um, the picture you can see on screen there is a hotel development that Polcom delivered in 2021 at Tower Bridge. Very, uh, very complex project right opposite um, Tower Bridge itself, over Tower Bridge uh, tube station. Um, uh, and a very, you know, very, uh, a project we're very proud of. We've got further acquisitions in the pipeline. Uh, some of those I can't talk about, but it's going to bring more technologies and geographical area. Uh, coverage uh, un under the global under the global VBC brand. Um, within the group, we've also got a multidisciplinary design house, eighty strong, currently based out of Boston, uh, Massachusetts, but also with resources across Europe, Serbia, Poland. Um, so that so sort of gives us um, an incredibly good uh, handle on the various technologies and the ability to to deliver a technology to suit a project rather than force uh, our technologies into a project that doesn't particularly suit. And within that team, we've got dedicated product development and manufacturing platform teams. So, um, you know, we really, really uh, sort of at the forefront uh, of, of global modular progress. Um, these are our factories. Currently, we've got four factories globally. And the one on the left-hand side in Hamlet there, we're actually just winding that factory down because we've got one in, in Berwick outside Philadelphia, which is slightly closer to our head office, a uh, slightly bigger facility. But um, the factory that we're really, you know, really, really proud of is the middle one there, the Tracy in California. So this was the old Katera factory, uh, if anybody is uh, aware of that. And it's an incredibly high technology. So sort of what we're using as our exemplar uh, blueprint for future factories for industrialized manufacture and it genuinely uses flow line technology um, which I know a lot of manufacturers talk about but very few you know properly implement we also manufacture cabinetry and furniture out of there for uh, our volumetric products but also open market sale uh, and then the the shot on the right is Gdansk um, well it's not actually Gdansk our head office is in Gdansk um, we've got two factories one to the north of Poland in Gdynia and one uh, our furniture factory which is in the heartlands in the south um, so again as well as uh, as well as the volumetric products we, we we generally use steel in Poland but we've got a uh, furniture and established furniture manufacturing business which produce over 40,000 pieces of furniture every year so so that's our current stock um, and our aspiration as a business by 2028 with the support of PIMCO is to be a billion dollar turnover business um, supported by 11 factories now we yet to decide where additional factories are going to be located but there is definitely an aspiration to invest in the UK. Um, so moving on to our business approach, this is sort of the last slide on my gratuitous selling, and then and then I'll move on to the uh, the crux of the presentation. So we consider ourselves what we call a vertically integrated business. So as I said, we've got a strong design function in house, so we can take a project from concept. We can introduce different technologies. We can introduce hybrid technologies. And then we can provide building components and furniture. So we, you know, we can truly, truly provide that whole vertically integrated ap approach. Uh, in the US, uh, as a legacy of the general contracting business, we offer a full turnkey model. In other markets, certainly uh, the projects that Polcom have delivered in the UK, we tend to do that on a partnership basis with a local contractor. And uh, we've worked with the likes of uh, Balfour Beatty um, and, uh, and other similar names. The very last piece of the puzzle, uh, I guess, is OEM products. We have a line of components that we call VMX, and these are components that we uh, source direct from China. So things that we use a lot of sanitary ware, toilet, uh, sorry, taps, um, flooring components, ceramic tiling. We we actually get them manufactured ourselves by 
by the dedicated manufacturers rather than rely on third parties. So, so that gives us this, this, um, this truly vertically integrated approach. So the direction I wanted to take, uh, thank you guys for your time, uh, for, for staying and listening, is a little bit different. Um, the focus of this is what's new in off-site. So the direction I want to go in really is what new thinking do we need to embrace tech, to embrace MMC? Because I think off-site construction, modern methods of technology are not new. So do we need to think differently? I mean, yes, it's, it's, you can only see what's happening in the market currently. You can see what's happened to the likes of Ilka Holmes, the likes of Legal in general, the likes of Caledonian Modular and, and how the market's struggling. We, we have to think differently. So let's frame that using these questions. Is off-site construction a modern method of construction? No. As I said, I work for a UK business, UK modular business that was over 50 years old. Um, there are many, many success stories across multiple sectors. You've got programs in healthcare, education, defence, justice. They've all been successful. And then you'll see I've put some photographs up there just, um, uh, just to, uh, to titillate as much as anything. Um, Post-war, 1945 to 1950, 200,000 prefab houses were built in that period. Now, I'm not going to be the first to say that they were the, you know, ideal example of modular construction, but some, they're still standing 70 years later. So, so is, is MMC new? No, it's not. And what if we broaden that uh, definition even further? Instead of off-site construction, let's look at off-site components. We all use them. Even traditional contractors use them. Bathroom pods, roof trusses, door sets, pre-manufactured kitchen cabinets. Okay, all those things are designed to make the process quicker and the quality more predictable. But what's the big difference? For me, it's productization. And I think John may have touched on it, the word productization. Why can we not treat buildings like products? Why do we have to test every single building every single time? Can we not develop a way as an industry of coming up with with a method for compliance that doesn't involve testing every single time. So is MMC intrinsically innovative? No, not in the UK. What, what we do in the UK, from my experience, is we construct off-site. Okay, we do not we do not industrialise manufacture, and there's a significant difference between off-site construction and industrialised manufacture. Off-site construction is low volume, one-off projects, bespoke designed, individually procured, slow to design and construct. Industrialized manufacture uses standards, repeatable components, large volume, consistency, quicker time frames. So what we've got to do to get there, because clearly the way we procure in buildings isn't working. So what does a modular business need? Let's look at it from the perspective of a modular building a modular business. For me, it's not driven by the technology. It's not driven by an advancement in products. It's not driven by IP protected build systems. What makes a modular business successful is its systems and its processes. And ironically, flexibility. So what do I mean by flexibility? Well, you need an ability to develop your technologies that work in different sectors and respond to different clients. You need the ability to scale the business to make change in demand, and you need multiple and interchangeable technologies and ways of delivering buildings that are not rigidly uh, defined by your technology. So what basically what our business needs are full factories. It's as simple as that. So, you know, clearly the UK market is not ready for the Model T Ford. It's not ready to roll out buildings that look and feel uh, you know aesthetically the same so final bullet point on there is it working well no we've already established haven't we that there's a lot of modular manufacturers failing there's a i think for me it feels like we're at a knife edge 
Um, I was involved in the education programs and the defense programs and some of the leads in those programs stood up and said, guys, you've got two years to prove yourselves. And if we don't, that's going to set back MMC for about a decade. And I think for me, we're on the cusp of that knife edge. So if we don't get it working soon, then I fear that we're going to go full circle and we're going to have to wait. So, so how do we think differently? Um, you know, these, these are my, my opinions, okay, but having been in the industry for a while and having also been, uh, been involved in uh, traditional contracting, we need some different approaches. And again, I'm not suggesting there's a single solution. Um, different sectors need different approaches and even different subsectors. Um, you know, single story, two story domestic scale housing needs a different approach to large scale, medium rise, built to rent. So we have to have different approaches. But design for me, it all starts with design. Um, MMC does not have to mean a compromise in building aesthetic. That's the first thing to get out of the way. But what we cannot start doing or keep doing is, is retrofitting modular solutions into traditionally designed buildings. OK, we have to get to the clients, we have to get to the investors, we have to get to the consultants before they put pen to paper. Variety can be achieved. Modular doesn't necessarily have to be repetitive. It needs to be standardised, but not repetitive. We can do variety. As I said before, variety is not what causes us problems, it's empty factories. So I'm going to make a comparison that a lot of people always make to, to uh, off-site volumetric construction, and that's to the motor manufacturing industry. Most motor manufacturing industries now have got the process down to fine art. And I don't know if anyone's ordered a car recently, but you don't buy from stock anymore. Motor manufacturers will build to order. You place an order and that order goes straight through to the factory. But when you buy a car, you're not told it must be a red one and it must be a hatchback and it must have this interior, it must have that exterior. So what the motor, what the motor manufacturing industry has managed to do is keep variety, but their systems and processes are so well honed that their relationships where their supply chains are so well honed that a product will arrive from the supplier just in time to be delivered to the point on the production line when that element needs installing in that car. And then the next car along the line could be a different car, different chassis, different engine, different components. And for me, that, that is how we, have to, how we have to look at this. Design for manufacture needs to move away from modularizing a building. It needs to look at the more granular detail of the components that make up that building. So the second point on their procurement, I think this is absolutely critical. Um, we need programs that aggregate demand. Aggregate demand, standardised solutions, solutions across geographical regions and indeed sectors. Um, there's been a number of initiatives over the years and I've been involved in a few about different procurement methodologies, things as simple as just trying to aggregate demand across a cluster of London boroughs. And it's been made too difficult. Agenda, political agendas and um, geographical problems and, and, you know, differences in funding models and, you know, lots of, lots of reasons why that can't happen. We've got to, you know, government has to break down those barriers and start aggregating some demand. The other thing is about how we procure the buildings, the mechanisms we use, the contracts we use. We're still using traditional contracts to procure modular buildings. Doesn't work. Does not work. Um, as I said before, I'm working in Saudi and the volume aspiration over there is just mind blowing. And they're looking at all sorts of different ways of procuring modular buildings. And one of the things they're using is manufacturing buildings under an equipment supply contract. So instead of procuring it as a building, they're procuring it as a piece of equipment. Now, for me, you know, that's that's innovative thinking. Let's 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 think outside the JCTs and the NECs. And um, the other thing I've put on here is platform. Platform is a bit of a buzzword. And 
absolutely unified design and standardization standardized solutions can help in aggregating pipeline but for me bulk procurement is more important than forcing a platform uh, the next bullet point then approach to financing i'm not going to dwell on this one because i could spend a whole hour talking about the approach to financing but obviously mmc is a different model you know it's a huge upfront capital investment it, it needs a huge investment in material procurement up front and then we burn money really quickly up front so we can't use the same financing models we've been using for lots of years and then the last one collaboration collaboration is a word that i, I personally have you know been using for 30 years or more um but do we collaborate do we really collaborate i'm i'm not convinced we do and um, for me for modular to be successful we have to you've got to decouple i mentioned before about designers looking at the granular detail of a, of a fabricated a, man, a factory fabricated building we've got to decouple the different elements and and look at who has got the specialism of, of delivering each each different element of that building i've talked about hybrid you know we're, we're currently as a business looking at clt podiums and then on top of that clt podium potentially light gauge steel or or wood um so it doesn't necessarily have to be one contractor that delivers all those component parts um but we've got to we've got to uh collaborate properly openly honestly to be able to 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 see there's enough volume out there for everybody without us trying to deliver parts of a building that are not our specialism so new thinking Coming back to the original question, platform solutions. I talked about platform solutions, great in principle. But the problem is for me, the platform solutions at the minute are all focusing on product, product innovation. What about thinking about it in a different way? What about standardizing approaches to compliance? There are a number of contractors out there that there are a number of contractors that are no longer out there that have invested significantly in technologies and developed systems that work. So why are we trying to develop more platforms that force people to use something that, that they're not familiar with? Why don't we look at the processes and systems and the building regulations and the fire compliance? How can we make it easier? I've got ideas. Um, you know, we could, we could look at government appointed factory inspectors for fire compliance. Let's come up with some standards and, and, you know, and get inspectors visiting factories to confirm compliance instead of taking everybody's components on every project and setting fire to them. Standardization. Standardization is a bit of a theme, but going back to the car analog analogy, standardization doesn't mean delivering a hundred boxes that are exactly the same. Standardization means taking the key components of, of a building and making them standard there are lots of examples i'm sure you've all seen lots of examples of fantastic buildings and where the individualism and the aesthetic and the architectural uh, beauty of the building comes from the facade you know comes from the the wrap the building wrap that's not materially affecting the components that have gone into that building so we need to we need to think about what standardization actually means and we've got to convince people clients end users that standardization doesn't mean boring doesn't mean you're going to get you know lego brick buildings um collaboration that word's there again but this time i'm going to blend it with project integration if we're going to break buildings down into component parts and give each component to the manufacturer that's best place to manufacture that component then we need in project integration what we don't need are main contractors taking responsibility for those elements of the work and then the mmc providers being a domestic subcontractor in a traditional contract relationship okay we have to come up with different ways and it's good to see that already you've got um frameworks like lhc with the OPI one, uh, or, you know, already um, put in elements of their frameworks uh, together using these project integration specialisms. 
I am going to caveat that though, and, and with a word of warning. Um, in my experience, there's a lot of self-titled independent modular specialists out there uh, roaming the market that purport to help the MMC industry, um, you know, but are in it for personal gain. So again, you know, we have to be we have to be careful. What my advice is: engage the MMC contractors from the outset. Find a way of communicating right at the beginning of the procurement chain and communicating direct. So the big one at the end is probably the nub of this for me. As, a, as an outside manufacturer who's got a global presence looking at the UK market, there has to be some attraction for us to invest. Brexit has caused problems because we've now got unique compliance standards. We are now not linked to European compliance standards. You've obviously got the shift and the move away from labour, uh, you know, going back to back to Europe, which has caused us problems. But that can play into the into you know the hands of the MMC. Um, but there are a number of things that, that that can be done to attract investment back, and and for me, pipeline aggregation has to be the start of it. So I think we've got a few minutes left. So what I'll, just right at the end. Um, there's a lot, probably a lot to think about there and a lot of ideas. I'm more than happy to stick around and take questions uh, well after five o'clock. Um, just to prove that we have got some product innovation at the end, um, one of our current innovations is bamboo. Um, you know, as, 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 as John uh, very eloquently um, presented, you know, sustainability has got to be at the forefront of our thinking. Um, and I don't know if anybody watched the Earth documentary on TV last night. It was absolutely fantastic. You should you should look that up. Um, but bamboo for me and for us, for VBC as a business, is something that we really look into investing. Um, you know, just to give you some, just to give you some some statistics, um, it's actually carbon negative as a material. It sequesters more carbon than it emits through harvest, manufacturing, construction. The solution, this prime wall solution that we demonstrate in here, uh, reduces thermal bridging over a traditional wood system by 90%. It's twice the, twice the strength of traditional timber stud. Um, and it's an, it's an almost hollow cavity you can fill with whatever blown insulation you want. Um, just moving that on a step further. So that's already in production. We're already delivering buildings um, using that technology as prototypes. The next step is the is the mass. So this is mass timber bamboo. So this is currently in development and we're looking at using this for medium to high rise developments. So again, some stats, uh, it's an embodied carbon reduction of 50% over CLT, 98% stiffer than CLT. 27% thinner and 17% 17 lighter. So again, just in terms of not, not wanting to absolutely bore you with numbers, but over a typical 70-year building lifespan, bamboo would, re, re, would decrease the carbon use by 44% of a building. And what's probably even more um, what's probably even more important is one hectare of sustainably managed bamboo catches 1,625 more metric tonnes of CO2 per year than trees, and it can be harvested after only seven years. So it's five to, uh, it's five to six times more carbon productive than wood. So thank you very much. Appreciate you all listening. And uh, I'll hand you back over to Rachel and Trevor. Well, thank you very much, David. Really good. Really, um, really interesting. And yeah, if only housing, the housing industry could mimic the car industry in terms of efficiency and production, uh, it'd be wonderful. But I, I suspect that um, bricklayers don't have to worry. They, their trails will still be needed for a, a few years yet. Um, but we'll see how it goes. So um, that concludes the speakers. So we're on to questions. I see we haven't got too many, but... Um, Let's let's see what we've got. One is uh, from Lee Stewart, and I think it's possibly more a comment than a than a question. But Lee, chip in if I get it wrong. But you, you're saying that we do have products pre-approved called LABC type approval. We have roofing systems type approved. Why not offsite modules? Well, yeah, from a building control point of view, of course, 
the standardization involved in in offsite uh, construction lends itself to to a type approval and 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 local state building control organizations around the country are, are standing waiting as we are to um to to set up partnerships to do exactly that when when need arises um i'm not sure what the was there any more of a question there lee if so please come back in the q a and i'll i'll uh, follow that up but but thanks for the comment anyway um next up type, type approval type approval is not unknown but but not mm. necessarily in the uk the singapore uh, building control authority type approves modules well, building control, local authority building control can type approve it as yeah. any system. Um, really, you know, if you, you build it once, you can build it a hundred times um, as long as you adjust for any local requirements or climatic issues. So um, we're all set up to, to to take applications for this sort of work and um, and streamline the process in that case. So um, they are. Let, let's say that now to all, all manufacturers out there who who are thinking of uh, entering the market. Um, Peter, Peter Redshaw um, asks, has there been an analysis of why the modular house building companies failed? Does that, did anybody in the three want to chip in there or, or more than more than one of you potentially? We're talking about um, Ilga Holmes and, um, and others who, who have uh, gone to the wall lately, I guess. I, I'd just say, um, just to echo David's comments that the finance system, the procurement system, the whole, uh, it, it's not geared towards MMC at the moment. It's, it needs a really good look at and some, just to echo David's points about it. He's, he's, he's pretty well stated what, why those fail because they weren't able to achieve, you know, we're, we're not, it's not a level playing field by any, any, any part. I think following on from that, I think the pipeline is absolutely there. The government aspirations are, are there. The headline numbers are there. The, you know, the need for affordable housing, it's all there. But there's too too many barriers in the way. The, you know, the big investors, the legal and generals, and, you know, the Goldman Sachs can see the need, can see the pipeline, but it's getting to it. And that and that and that's the problem at the minute. You know, the systems are there, the technologies are there, the processes are there, but the pipeline has to come easier and in, with more volume. I think that's what the UCL research is is, is looking at on behalf of Homes England. It's, it's the forces for and against the adoption of of a, an MMC approach, and I think a lot of the focus is actually on modules. There are there are far more products available. Um, from a on pre-manufacturing perspective. And I think a, a, quite a few of these are obviously successful. Um, timber frame panel systems are used, are used extensively for, for residential developments. Mm. Um, okay, countryside homes had a slight uh, blip um, when they put the sort of mothballed the factory, but they've reopened it again. Um, and there are other major uh, manufacturers. Um, Vistry, for example, um, Donaldson Timber, I mentioned, we're, we're obviously looking to visit their factory where, where they're introducing um, robotics. So I think um, there is a focus, there tends to be a focus in the press on, on volumetric modular, but I think MMC goes way, way beyond just modules. Mm. I, I think there's, a, there's another element to this as well. The, the government frameworks that I've been involved in, the only way for the MMC contractors to get on these frameworks and to get a reasonable allocation of volume is to take on work scope that they're not best placed to take on. You know, they've, they, the, the government push MMC contractors to become full turnkey delivery contractors. And in my experience with the company I worked with, that is the area where the inefficiencies crept in, the money was lost, and all the benefits of a manufactured product were, less, were lost by not managing the high risk elements of the project, the groundworks, you know, the retaining walls, the services. So, so the government shouldn't be pushing MMC contractors to become main contractors. They should recognize that manufacturing is a very different skill to construction, but procure it in a different way, productize it, procure it as a product, don't make MMC contractors subservient to main contractors. 
<clears throat> I think demarcation is quite a key issue there, David. I think that's what you to capture it in one word. And I think there was a there was a a, a, a contract model which seemed to work for your previous one of your previous employers over a period of about what was it from about two thousand and six to two thousand and fifteen. Very lucrative, yeah. Yes, yeah, but it was done by way of sharing risks. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that. I'll move, I'll move things on because we've got a couple of other questions and uh, we will run over a bit. So thanks for everybody to come along. If, if you do need to go, then then thanks for joining us. But do hang on and, and listen to the remaining questions if you've got time, because there, there, there's some good ones here. Uh, one I must ask, because it's um, from Gary Cass, who's my new boss. So if I don't ask this one, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> um, apologies if I missed this, but what issues are the presenters encountering with overheating and lack of thermal mass in, uh, I guess he's referring to sort of lightweight modular units, especially uh, in the context and advent of the hotter summers. And of course, we've got now part O building regulations trying to address the the effects that they're going to have on the population, um, you know, and the effects on vulnerable people. So does anyone want to um, take that one? Uh, I, I'm happy to address that one. Um, Please, John. While, while the pand pandemic was on, we were part of an Innovate UK project looking at the modular construction with uh, nine other manufacturers, including Legal and General and people like that. And we were able to, because we couldn't physically build anything during that sort of 2020, 21, we model things and we we're able to sort of look at we how do we create buildings that are comfortable both in up for overheating as well. So currently you can work to the, there's a 2050 target um will your but will your building overheat um with the rising temperatures potentially in 2050 we we were able to achieve those um targets and you know still maintain levels of comfort but we pushed it a bit further and said well what about 2080 because there's another ramp up then <clears throat> and what we found was our, our buildings would potentially need um some extra retrofitting of say solar shading by that point so by choosing a building that makes sure it's robust enough that you can have points that you can identify within your BIM model that can say future, I hate the word future proofing, but for allowing for climatic change and say, well, if you need to fix a, 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 a breeze soleil, some sort of solar shading shutters, I think we'll see a lot more shutters in the UK in years to come. Um, make sure the, the fixing points are there and that people aren't just trying to bolt them onto the cladding and stuff like that. So there's, there is people who are thinking out there thinking, let's not just build for, yeah, volumetric or modular it shouldn't be just a quick solution. It should be a long term solution as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, copying back to part O, of course, in London, we will, it was a default provision to have um, solar shading or, or something like that on every new dwelling um, since that's cut in. So um, we will definitely see a lot more and they, unless they're modeled to, to show that they're not necessary. Um, so a question from Stephen J. Elms, um, what issues are there with planning permission across councils and how does the industry need to inform and educate those who make planning decisions? That's assuming the planners need educating. Well, I'm not going to comment on that. They're all on my best <clears throat> planners. I, I personally think that pointing the finger at planning authorities is, is, is not, that's not the issue. Um, if, and I was going to say that there's, there's a way to approach the use of MMC offsite or anything. Um, and it goes back to what um, David was, was suggesting as well. Um, and, and I'm going to use an expression here, which is not my own, but what you do is you standardize the invisible and you customize the visible. And that should be the approach with planning authorities. They should be concerned about what they see on the outside um, and, and what, the vo what the mass of the building is. And then they shouldn't really be concerned about what's inside. And David touched on that as well in terms of um, a client wanting to see every nail and every screw in a module effectively when it comes to placing an order. Um, and I, I really think people hang this, the issues with, with modular and with MMC on, on the planning tag, but I don't think it should be there at all if the planning authorities adopt the right approach. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for that. And a final question then, um, apologies if I pronounce it wrong, Farita, Farita um, would a move away from allocated social housing from developers 
and a move back to local council building be a better solution? Back to local council building. Right, well, yeah, do we want the councils to start building homes again um, and take the responsibility from the current social housing pro providers? Well, that's a, yeah, that's Absolutely. quite a radical step. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Personally, yes. Um, because I've seen too many schemes in London where the, the, the social housing provision has been diminished and diminished. And even some of the Transport for London schemes where they're developing car parks on public land and they were saying, well, we, we, we couldn't make the 30 percent or 35 or 40 percent. It's down to 25 percent provision ago because it wasn't feasible. And I'm thinking my my I was one few people said build this, but make sure it, it's public land. Why is it not 100 percent affordable housing? Um, that's that's just a, a no brainer, but it's this whole feasibility that comes in. Um, I'd rather they, any any public funded whether it's of local authorities, uh, transport, whatever, then uh, or maybe uh, transport for London. Why not do a hundred percent? You've got a great opportunity to uh, uh, take a box. So yes, uh, I'll be. I'm a supporter of that initiative, but that's a dangerous political area to stray mm. into as well. Just a little bit. Excellent. Well, I think uh, we're at ten past the five. Um, there is one more question. Um, so we cover it. Yeah, let's let's do it. Why not? And then it wraps it up nicely. Um, uh, good trouble is the big question to answer. What are the challenges from an anonymous attendee, somebody who wishes to remain anonymous? Now, anybody want anybody to know that they attend such things as this? It's uh, um, what are the challenges of MMC with respect to insurers, risks, concerns, etc. Not a quick one, is it? But um, who wants to give it their best? <coughs> I'll kick start it. One of the issues that, that comes out from insurers is, is lack of understanding of the product. And one of the major concerns when it comes to pre-manufactured um, elements of a building is the potential to miss a uh, fault in the factory, which is then exacerbated through either multiple construction of uh, the assembly, the product or whatever it is. And that's, that, that's, that's of major concern. Um, but it, it, but it does, uh, and then getting the right assurance. And, and John spoke about BOPAS, which is the Build Off Site Property Assurance Scheme. Um, that is, seeks to provide an assurance that there is a process in place to make sure these errors don't occur. And, and currently, BOPAS uh, offers a sixty-year uh, assurance. Um, although the next level up is BOPAS Plus, which is a hundred years uh, assurance. But I think that's that's the basic concern from the insurance industry, and they have a long list of things. Um, from the, there are there are basics that go into the modular industry, whereby, um, and I think legal and general fell, fell foul of of one of a, a basic mistake where they left modules uncovered, and they got wet, so of course they they got damp, which which is there's no excuse for that. It's it's pretty fundamental. It's pretty basics, and these are the sort of things that these are the sort of risks that the insurers are, are rather nervous about. Yeah, understandably. Fine. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for uh, finishing off with that uh, great answer, Ken. And uh, thanks to all all the speakers once again. I think that went extremely well and was uh, very very interesting indeed. Um, thanks to Rachel in the control room as well, keeping keeping that. Everybody uh, um, from, from heckling in the background, that's uh, worked very well. Um, so, Rachel, yeah, what, what have we got in the pipeline before? Thanks for hanging on those who did hang on. And um, what have we got in the pipeline? Yeah, I'll just mention everybody that's attended today will get a CPD certificate sent straight to their inbox. So watch out for that by the end of this week. Um, what have we got next? So in August, um, Trevor will be talking about dangerous structures for us that's on the 15th of august um so bookings are open do look on our website um for that or or, or we can find you can find us on eventbrite as well yeah that's not just for building control people though hopefully that that'll be of interest a few good photos in there uh, to let people know what we do that's one of the, the strings to our bow is, is dealing with 20 uh with dangerous structures 24 7 in this county so um if you're interested in that sort of thing then hook into it and we'll do our best for you anyway i think that that concludes so one final thank you to everybody uh 
thank you all for attending especially those who, who hung on to the bitter end and we'll see you again soon so make sure you get registered and, and we'll see you then thank, thank you. you thanks bye for now. bye, bye. bye.